Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mount Vernon. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to take a minute now, turn around, and greet someone you don't know with the peace and the love of Jesus Christ. Well, again, welcome to worship here at Mount Vernon. There are several announcements to, to bring to your attention. First, a correction to the bulletin. Um, the flowers this morning have been lovingly given by Earl Thomas, and Melinda wants me to make sure I make that known. Um, please be aware that Earl has donated the flowers this morning. Following worship today, over in the Education Building is our last Pumpkin Festival meeting. We still have all kinds of opportunities for you to become involved. We are especially looking for people to, I think we need about four people to help with some of the games. So if you're interested in just signing up, you can do that on the um, bulletin board as you leave in the narthex. If you're available and can come over to the meeting, feel free to do that. And um, Wilda and Janice will plug you in somewhere. So we'd love to have you involved with that. Next Sunday, immediately following worship, is our fall congregational meeting. The purpose of the meeting is to hear a report from the Conk Committee. That is the group that is responsible for bringing before us nominees for session. So that meeting will take place next Sunday. It should be a very short meeting. Please plan on sticking around after worship for that. We announced last week... Um, Many of you know the Lane family. The Lane family has been in very involved with the Agape ministry for the past several years. Edna had open heart surgery, triple bypass this past week. Um, and Chris, is Chris here? Chris, where are you? Chris Guerin is coordinating meals. We're going to try to get some meals over. She has um, four men in her family, boys and men to be taken care of. We're trying to line up some folks who would be willing to provide meals. So um, if you're available to do that, Chris, raise your hand one more time. Chris Guerin is coordinating that. Please see Chris after worship today. And lastly, um, I hope you uh, noticed when you sat down this morning that we have new hymnals in our pews. Session recently approved the use of the new Presbyterian hymnal, which is titled Glory to God, and they have been very lovingly given by long, in, in, in memory of Ann Shep. Um, Ann was a longtime choir member, a longtime office secretary. She passed away last December, and the hymnals have been given in her memory. Um, she has, I believe, two... Does she have family here this morning? Did they? There you guys are. Nice to have you with us. If you do not know, have not met Ann... You guys are from Dale's, Dale City? If you've not met Ann's grandsons, they're right down front, very formal looking in their ties this morning. So be sure to... You guys look like Mormon missionaries here among us today. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Thanks for coming on behalf of the, the family. Listen to what has been written about hymnals. Just hymnals in general. Congregational songbooks are friends and companions on the Christian journey. They accompany us through the church year, amidst significant events in our lives, and in times of both great faith and doubt. So today we want to pause and give thanks for the worn hymnals that have been donated and recycled, as well as to dedicate the fresh new ones that you find before you. Will you pray with me, please? God, today we want to give you special thanks for the gifts of music and song. 
And we trust that these new additions to our worship space would be more than just books, pages with notes and lyrics. But rather, God, may they be for us vehicles to inspire in times of joy and in sorrow, uniting our voices in the harmony of song and equipping us to proclaim your message of justice and grace, peace and love. We thank you too for Anne Shep and for her witness of praise and service that was boldly lived out for all of us to see. May each of us so live our lives to the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, now let us come together and worship God. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the many opportunities each of us have, and it's not the least of which is to live in this great country and to practice our faith. Please help this church and each of us to maximize that gift as we try to bring faith 
to life in the 21st century. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, you can join me on page 386 of your Bible, and it'll probably be helpful because there's a lots of names in here, and I'll not get them correct. Uh, I'll actually be reading our scripture, uh, which is Esther 1, uh, verse 1 through 12, and I'll be reading from the Living Edition, so you'll see I'll use Xerxes instead of King Asherah, which is probably not correct either, but that's the more common usage. These events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days, a tremendous display of opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. When it was all over, the king gave a banquet for all of the people, from the greatest to the least, who were in the fortress of Susa. It lasted for seven days and was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. The courtyard was beautifully decorated with white cotton curtains and blue hangings which were fastened with white linen cords and purple ribbons to sil silver rings embedded in the marble pillars. Gold and silver couches stood on a mosaic pavement of periphery, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Drinks were served in gold goblets by many designs, and there was an abundance of royal wine reflecting the king's generosity. By edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking for the king had instructed all of his palace officials to serve each man as he wanted. At the, quaint, at the same time, Queen Vashita gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him, Mumon, Bistha, Harbana, Bigtha, Abgatha, Zektar and Karkas to bring Queen Yashita, or Vashita to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted all the nobles and the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was beautiful. But when they conveyed the king's order to Queen Vashita, she refused to come. This made the king furious, and he burned with anger.
Would the boys and girls come on down front and join me for the children's sermon, please? Hey, Grace. <clears throat> oh, remember to walk. Remember to walk. Have a seat, bud. So, Grace, you got the bag last week, huh? What, what did you bring for us to see? You guys all know Grace? Yep. What did she bring? Can, can I hold that up for everybody to see? Can you tell us what it is? It's what? It's a bracelet. How many of you guys have a bracelet? Just, do just the girls have bracelets? Yeah? You have so much. Why do you wear? Why do you? What do you do with this? You put it. Why? To look pretty, so it can sparkle. Okay. This is your sparkling one. How come just girls do that and boys don't? You you ha, you do have bracelets. Like okay, so sometimes guys wear bracelets, right? You have bracelets. What do? You have a bracelet. So, so guys and girls wear bracelets. And why do they do that? Just, say that again. Just to look nice. Now, have you ever seen people who maybe look nice on the outside because they were wearing bracelets and maybe necklaces and maybe they were dressed really nice but weren't really very nice on the inside? Um, yes. yeah. You've never seen somebody like that? Just on TV shows? You've seen it in real life? Yeah, I, kinda, I think I've seen it sometimes in real life too. Sometimes we spend a lot of time putting on jewelry, you know, and like I had to shave this morning before I came here to make sure I looked clean cut. And I had to put on nice, nice kind of nice clothes. I didn't wear the shorts and the flip-flops that I was like wearing yesterday. I tried to look nice. Sometimes we spend a lot of time working on the outside of ourselves so that we look nice but we forget to pay attention to what's on the inside. Have you, do you ever think about that when you get up in the morning? Not just thinking about looking nice on the outside, but making sure that on the inside, you're going to be, you're going to look nice. You're going to be... That's a good point, Brielle. When, you're, when, we're, when we're working on the inside and we're trying to be kind and when we're trying to be generous to others, that just makes, I think, our outside sometimes even look that much nicer. Yeah. In the Bible, do you guys, do you, have you guys ever heard of David? He was a king in the Bible. Yep, yeah, that's right. In the, in the Bible, there's a what? A David in your class? Oh, Okay. Well, David was a king in the Bible. And, and David talks about God looking on our insides. God is most concerned, not with the outside of us, but with the inside. So every day, we need to be thinking about making sure that on the inside, we're being kind and we're being generous and we're speaking nicely to our brothers and our sisters and we're just being good people, all right? Gracie, thank you so much for bringing that in for us. We need to uh, pass this off. Have you not, you've not taken it home yet, have you? Okay, you can take it home for next. Are you going to be here next week? Okay, all right. Let's, let's pray, and then you guys can go to children in worship, all right? Dear God, thank you for, um, thank, you, thank you just for, for giving us things on the outside, maybe that make us look nice. We do appreciate that, like bracelets. But, but God, we especially want to be concerned about what's on the inside. So help us think about that every day whenever we wake up. Help us to be kind and generous and to speak kindly to others. In your name we pray and everybody said, amen. Okay, thanks. You can go back to your seats.
Will you pray with me, please? God, now by the power of your Holy Spirit, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts truly be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, the billboards were everywhere several years ago. Perhaps you saw some of them. They began, I'm told, down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and then they started showing up all around this country of ours. The format was very simple and straight to the point. There was was a brief one-line message, and then it was signed, God. So they said things like, need directions, God. Or, let's meet at my house Sunday before the game. God. One along a busy highway said, keep using my name in vain and I'll make rush hour longer. (laughs) And another one said, have you read my number one bestseller? There's going to be a test. I don't have any tests this morning, but I do have a question, as always. Which book of the Bible never mentions the name of God? Esther, that's right. The book of Esther. Nowhere in its ten chapters is God ever mentioned. It's one of the reasons many scholars did not want it even included in the canon of Scripture. But author and pastor Chuck Swindoll says, though absent by name from this particular book of Jewish history, God is present in each scene and in the movement of every single event. It's a wonderful book of the Bible that most of us have never really read or studied. And so I'm looking forward over the next several weeks to walk you through this wonderful Old Testament book written by, we don't know, but named after a woman. It's one of only two books in Scripture named after a woman. And for those of you who are wondering why, because believe it or not, I've actually had somebody say, we're going to spend six weeks studying Esther in, in, in worship. For those of you wondering why, Um, It has so much to say to us in this 21st century. So I challenge you to follow along. I'm going to be doing a Bible study on Wednesday mornings for the next six weeks so we can go into greater detail detail in each of the the passages that we'll be studying on Sunday morning. So read, follow along, come to the Bible study, and I guarantee by the end you will probably know more about Esther than any other book in the Bible. So although God's name is never mentioned, and although he is the most significant player in the story, there are many other characters. And this morning, the first character worthy of study is Queen Vashti. Queen Vashti. As chapter 1 points out, as Craig read for us, Vashti is the wife of the king of Persia, Xerxes or King Ahasuerus, which is how it's probably, I think, written in your translation. I like Xerxes just because it's so much easier to say. So that's the name we're going to be using over the next several weeks. We're in the, somewhere in the third year, it is believed, of Xerxes' reign, and it's supposedly somewhere about 480, 485 B.C. That's the time period. Now, the text makes it really clear, and rightly so, that Xerxes was a very powerful Persian king. We're told that he ruled an empire that stretched from India to Ethiopia, a huge piece of land. And apparently, we know from this morning's passage that he also really loved a good party. If you were following along, paying attention, 
Scripture says that he threw a party lasting how long? Six months. A six-month party. And when that particular banquet, banquet was completed, there was still another seven days where they kept going at it. So it must have been quite a time. Six months. There were parades of slaves and conquered people that no doubt were kind of brought before the celebrants at that time. Banquet tables were overflowing with the finest of delicacies, lavish displays of all the riches that had been amassed by the king with dancing and, yes, excessive drinking. Apparently, this was no big deal, no big deal because Xerxes was just that kind of a guy. Archaeological excavations have unearthed inscriptions in which this particular king referred to himself as the great king. Or interestingly, you've heard this phrase before, the king of kings. That's how Xerxes referred to himself. He didn't struggle with poor self-esteem, that's for sure. He was a man with an ego, and he held parties that would only feed that ego. They were his opportunity to show off everything that he had, everything that he had accomplished. So that's what he did. And in doing so, he brought great praise to his name. And that was something he loved as much as anything. Now in verse 10, we're told, and I think this was the translation that Craig read, we're told he was merry with wine. I like the more contemporary translation that puts it right there out on the table and says he was probably half drunk. He was actually smashed. If he had been drinking for six months, there's no doubt he was not functioning properly. But merry with wine, it sounds so biblical, doesn't it? He was merry with wine. We we try to gloss over the reality of what's going on sometimes. Either way, however you want to think about it, The king had been celebrating way too long. And that's when his problems began. Because it was at that point that Xerxes looks around at all of these great celebrations and he notices something. Someone, someone very important, in fact, is missing He looks around and he sees that the queen is nowhere to be found. And her absence was not about to go unnoticed. So when Xerxes realizes this, he orders his servants to bring, quote, his most prized possession to the banquet hall for everyone to see. In verse 11, bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing the royal crown, in order to show people and the officials her beauty, for she was fair to behold. Scholars have spent an incredible amount of time wrestling with this command of Xerxes. And as is the case with most of Scripture, they don't agree on very much. But what they do agree on is that the request was not entirely appropriate. Many have suggested that verse 11 implied that Vashti was to come wearing only her crown. Others have said that to behold her beauty, when you translate and really dig in to the Hebrew, that she was meant to come unveiled. And that would have been scandalous in the Persian court. Either way, the request was not reasonable or appropriate at all. Primarily because we know that the king was half drunk. His request had an unreasonable element to it or Vashti never would have responded the way she did. And boy, did she respond. Recognizing the unfair nature of the request, 
And in spite of the consequences that she knew would exist by disobeying the king, Queen Vashti refuses to show up. It's been said that she knew her beauty was her own and her husband's, and that it was not for open show among hundreds of half-drunk men. So she willingly and intentionally disobeys the king's request. She's not afraid to stand up to him. She knew. She knew she was being asked to do something that simply was not right, and so she refused to be part of her her king's frat party. Now, I don't know about you, but I like Queen Vashti already. What we're going to see over the next several weeks is that the women in the book of Esther were strong and dignified women. They were not afraid to challenge the injustices of their culture or to speak up in face of those things that they simply knew were not right. And when they did that, when they had the courage to do that, God seems to work through them in significant and powerful ways. So again, while his name is never mentioned, God was working in this response. And he's working through a woman who's not afraid to challenge unjust practices of their culture. Now Vashti knew, she had to have known, there were going to be consequences for her action. She knew that something would result from her being disobedient to the king. Over the next several weeks, follow along, read ahead, look into chapter 2 so you can see what happens. For the sake of this morning's message, suffice it to say that Xerxes does get ticked off. And so do the seven princes, whose whose names Craig read so beautifully. Where did you go, Craig? Yeah. They're just as furious, perhaps more furious than even Xerxes is. In verse 17... Mimukin, one of, one of them says, he's probably the most outspoken of all. He says, think about the example that Vashti is setting for all the other wives in the empire. Can you hear the conversation? Women everywhere will begin to despise and disobey their husbands. That's what he says to his friends. Before this day is out, the wife of every one of us will hear what the queen did and then they're going to start talking to their husbands the same way. Think about the conversation that they were having. Is your wife talking back to you too? You know why? It's it's Vashti. It's her fault. She's the one setting this bad example. The men were furious. And as a result... Vashti is thrown out of the palace. We never hear from her again. We have no idea what happens to Vashti. Now, some history books will say that eventually the next queen dies and Vashti is brought back as queen. One historian or group of historians does seem to follow that but it's certainly not mentioned anywhere in scripture and we don't know for sure that's what happens all we know in the book of Esther is that King Xerxes kicks Vashti out of the palace simply because she took a stand for what she knew was right we don't know anything about Vashti's faith But we do know that she was concerned about what was right. And so she wasn't going to tolerate, tolerate it, let alone participate in it. And when God sees that attitude, God uses it. When God sees that kind of concern for right living, for just behavior, for, for goodness, God honors it. And because of this act, in verse 19, what eventually we will see happens is the door is opened for Esther. 
who we'll deal, about, deal with in coming weeks. This morning, this morning, think about Vashti. Does good come to Vashti because she behaved in such an upright manner? You see, there, there's the problem. God is clearly at work in this story, but, but why is Vashti forced to pay the price for whatever good God is seeking to bring about? Why does God use Esther eventually and not Vashti? Have you ever felt that way? about things? Have you ever wondered why the good that God is seeking to do in the world doesn't include you? Why at times it almost is, seems as though it seems to exclude you? <clears throat> Have you ever wondered why you are the one who always seems to pay the price for the work that God is doing around you? I think that's how a lot of us feel sometimes. It's that whole nice guys finish last thing. We see God working. We see God moving. And we try hard to respond faithfully. But often, in fact, too often, things simply don't turn out the way we would like them to. At least not for us. God seems to be working apart from us with other people and through other lives. And we, well, we're just forced to experience life outside of the palace. I want to say to God, did Vashti really have to suffer because you wanted to do something? Why did she have to lose her crown, God? I mean, if you really are God, why didn't you take better care of her? Why weren't the king's eyes opened so he could see the error of his ways? So that Vashti, so that Vashti could be the one to do the great things that Esther wound up doing. Vashti was a strong woman. God was, Vashti was faithful God. And yet she was thrown out of the palace. She appears to have done all the right things. So why didn't it turn out better for her? Have you felt that way before? Often we think, often we tend to think that doing the right thing, that being faithful to God, that that, that means we're just going to enjoy blessing. We put the two together. Faithfulness equals blessing. But Vashti teaches us that that's not life. Sometimes nice guys and gals do finish last. Sometimes we can do all the right things and still suffer negative consequences. In too many places in our culture, in too many parts of the church, we want to be satisfied and honored for the good that we do, for the faithful lives that we leave. But then, then this story of Vashti comes along and shows us that that's not always the way things turn out. In Max Lucado's book, And the Angels Were Silent, he walks through the final events in Jesus' life, and he ultimately asks a question I think many of us ask. Why was God so silent during Jesus' death? How did the heavens not boil over in anger, Lucato writes? Rage over what was being done to this man in whom so many saw the face of God. Sometimes I think we ask those questions about our own lives. Are there not times, God, when you see the way we're being treated, 
When you see the injustice that is the result of our trying to follow you faithfully, why do you not respond? God, why do you not react? When we think we are doing all the right things, sometimes the consequences are just too painful. Vashti knows what that's like. So does Christian Rieger. Perhaps you know his story. He spent four years in the Dachau concentration camp. And why? Not because he was a Jew, but because he was a Christian. Millions of the Jews died at the hands of Hitler. We all know that. But over a million Christians also died. His story, Christian Rieger's story, is told in Philip Yancey's book, Where is God When It Hurts? And at the end of his imprisonment, he writes, For four years, God did not rescue me or make my suffering any easier. But he did prove to me again and again that he was alive and that he knew I was here. Rieger stood up to the Nazis on more than one occasion, but he paid the price for it. Four years in a concentration camp. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know his story. The author of the Barman Declaration, one of the historic creeds in the Presbyterian Church, he also took a stand simply because he knew the right thing to do. And when he called the church to challenge the unjust creed of Nazism, he was sent to the Flossberg camp. And in 1945, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hanged by piano wire. Before his death, before his death, he said that the job of the church is not only to help the victims who have fallen under the wheels of injustice, but to fall into the spikes of those wheels ourselves in order to halt the machinery of injustice. That's a challenge for us. When we're inclined to think that following God is just about going to worship on Sunday morning, where we can sing some of our favorite hymns, see all the people that we enjoy spending time with, laughing over a cup of coffee, we need to remember those words. I think it was Wilford Brimley who said on that commercial, it's the right thing to do. What was he talking about? Do you remember? I don't remember what it was. The right thing to do. What is the right thing to do? Vashti knew. Rieger knew. Bonhoeffer knew. They all did the right thing. But they weren't rewarded with praise and crowns and honor. Doing the right thing is not always easy. And sometimes there's a cost. And when the cost gets a little too high, what do we say? How do we respond? I wish I had an answer for these complex questions of faithfulness and blessing. But I don't. All I can say is that we can't ever give up. With Rieger, we need to see that God is always near, that God is good, and that even though there are times when he appears to be silent, we can never equate that silence with absence. We can never equate God's silence with God's absence. Because God is always working, and we are never alone. So this morning, learn a lesson from Queen Vashti. Learn from Christian Rieger and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Do the right thing regardless of the cost. Because our faith, friends, our faith will only come to life when that is how we seek to live. 
Let us pray. Lord God, in the quiet of these next few minutes, we pray that you would continue to speak to our hearts. And God, if, if anyone here feels kind of like Vashti, if anyone here feels like they're, they're trying to do the right thing, but feeling as though they've been kicked out of the palace, God, embrace those souls. Speak powerfully through that still, small voice within. And give them the assurance that while you may appear to be silent, you are not absent. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time, would our ushers please come forward to receive the offering.
offer up some prayers for two or three people that I know who are uh, fighting cancer and um, my friend who uh, I, I go out with, his mother is 96 and she fell and broke her hip so, and she did have, go through surgery so she is in recovery and she's in rehab. Uh, she's a feisty woman. <laughs> And, um, and then I'd like to offer a prayer for my neighbor who's going to uh, have a baby like any day. <laughs> so that's a happy occasion. All right. Barbara's friend struggling with cancer, a neighbor who's due any day, and another one that I forgot. Friend's mother. Well, that's oh, yeah. the fourth and, one. Too. And Mark and broke her hip. You will remember her. Nancy? Bosh.